Welcome back, everyone. In our last presentation that we had, listening to what was happening with this curse tablet, it is so exciting. And it, like we said, it's rare that you ever have a uh, discovery like this. And I'm back with Dr. Peter Vanderveen and Dr. Scott Stripling, and they're going to be talking about this amazing connection to the Bible. And Peter, a lot of people don't necessarily know what happened at Mount Ebal. Uh, and Mount Gerizim. Could you give us a little bit of the biblical backstory? Yes, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 27, we are told that when the Israelites cross the Jordan, um, there will be, um, they will be reminded of uh, following, observing uh, the law of Moses. And if they live by the, uh, the law of Moses, then there will be blessing. And Levi priest would speak blessings to the people of Israel when indeed they follow the law. If they do not do so, there will be curses. And these curses will be spoken on Mount Ebal. This is exactly what happens after Joshua and the Israelites cross the Jordan and uh, Jericho has fallen and they move um, inland. They come to um, Ebal to renew the covenant and it is here that an altar is um, actually built uh, to the Lord. It is this very place um, which is connected in biblical tradition, in the tradition of the, um, the conquest narrative uh, that's directly related to curses spoken against the people of Israel if they do not abide by the law of Moses. Another thing that's interesting about this location is that this is also the biblical location where uh, Jacob and his family were for a while and where Joseph's bones were to be returned. And I think right down below the mountain, there's a, a tomb that's attributed to the burial place of Joseph. And it's also the place where Joshua uh, put up, I, I believe it was a stone, a covenant stone. So there's, there's a lot of hot activity in this area, right? <laughs> And let me mention, most importantly, this is where the Abrahamic covenant was cut. So Elan More is right there. The next hill over is Elan More. And this is where Abram makes covenant with God. And that's why I believe Moses tells them to go back to that area, is they're going to reaffirm the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah, it's just amazing. It's such an important thing. So we were at the exciting part where this tablet, and as we take a look at it, what it looks like here, this curse tablet, it's folded, right? So inside the tablet is where the curses are. So what you use some type of technology, you sent it off to be scanned and to be examined? Uh, that's right. We uh, were able to find a lab in Prague. Because of COVID, I was locked out of Israel for a period of time. So we knew we had the find, but we could do nothing with it until I was finally able to get back into the country. And with the help of my friends, we Konigsberg, we were able to curry it to Prague. And in the lab there then, they had a track record of being able to scan through lead, which was shocking to me because I didn't know you could scan through lead. Um, what an amazing day we live in. When you go to, to the dentist, they put that lead thing on you when they're gonna do x-rays. Apparently that does no good <laughs> because now we know you can scan through lead. We began to you know, see these slices that appeared and we could then see that there was fats. When did curse tablets come into being or, or you know, how is that culturally a part of that okay. culture? Well, I'll start it and Peter, you can, you can finish it. These are common from the fifth and sixth century BC onward, like into the Hellenistic and Roman period. This specific phenomenon, we really don't have parallels for it in this early period. And that's one of the things that is so important about this is it's rewriting our understanding of these. We now know that they did exist much earlier. And of course, we should have known this from the biblical text in Job chapter 19. And many scholars would believe Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's a late Bronze Age text. There's no mention of the law of Moses, for example. Job says in Job 19, 24, oh, that my words were written on a lead tablet with an iron pen. So it's a very ancient so, sort of an idea. Binding, it, when, the, when the tablet is sealed, the curse becomes binding and it, it brings one into accountability. Okay, Peter, what would you like to add to that? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, actually, the two things. The very fact that uh, let is sporadically used uh, for writing, even during the Late Bronze Age, um, is um, attested by a discovery that was made several years ago at the capital of the Hittites in Anatolia, where they also found a very similar tablet. And it has also been quite uh, daunting to actually decipher the text because they hardly could open it, but it has about the same size. From a slightly later period, the Neo-Hittites, the Luvians, they did use also lead, lead strips to write on and they have been found in Syria, they have been found in Assur, in Mesopotamia. But the, um, the phenomenon of cursing people, not on lead, but on pottery shirts and pottery figurines goes back to the Middle Kingdom in Egypt during the 12th and 13th dynasties. We actually have these from Egypt where the Egyptians um, curse their enemies be they from Nubia, some are from, from Syria, from, from Canaan, and they curse these people, and then they break the shirts, they break the figurines, throw them into the fire, um, so that um, they will not be remembered. This tradition continues right into the New Kingdom period as well, where we also have curse tablets, but on pottery. So actually, um, we do have this phenomenon, but we do not have it on lead. And this is where the Mount Ebal uh, curse inscription com comes into play, because this is the first lead, uh, curse lead inscription that we know of, yes. I think many have probably been found, but because teams were not wet sifting, they ended up in the dump pile. And isn't that just shocking to go to all the expense and all the effort to excavate and then to miss critical evidence? So I predict we will find others, but you won't find one like this because this one is not the petty sort of a curse. Tim, these things are usually amulets and they're like petty, in Israel at least, and we have hundreds of them from there. You'll find them in wells and in graves and things like that. And they're usually very petty like she stole my 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 man and may her reproductive organs dry up or something like that this is nothing like that okay this is this is a judicial declaration it's a a summation of the curses of deuteronomy coming together and then i think one person a titular head wrote this sealed it and laid it on the altar and this then gets down to the question of literacy were Moses and Joshua literate individuals? Because many seminary, maybe most seminary students are taught that they were not. They, yeah, and that, that would, goes back to the whole part of teach these commands to your children, you know, in Deuteronomy, uh, write them on your doorposts. Well, the thing is, how are the Israelites supposed to do that if they didn't have some form of writing? And that goes back to the proto sinaitic inscriptions in, in, in our film, The Moses Controversy, when I started hearing about these uh, types of inscriptions and the fact that they migrate from Egypt into the Promised Land, into Israel, it just starts tying it all together. That is why this is such an exciting and powerful, I mean, this changes, this changes the whole world of archaeology, and that's why this is uh, earth-shaking. We're going to get more into what that's about in our next segment. So everyone stay tuned. We've got more to come. They'll be back.